Welcome to Beyond the Lab, uh, a series sponsored by the Office of Career Development in the Biomedical Research, Education, and Training Department at the Vanderbilt School of Medicine. My name is Kate Stewart, and I have with us here today Erin Flint. She is a uh, she received her PhD uh, in 2007 in cancer biology. So welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Glad to be here. Um, so tell us about what you did while you were at Vanderbilt. Um, I came into Vanderbilt through the IGP program, and um, I joined Susan Casper's lab, who um, she's no longer here, but she was part of the um, prostate cancer group, and um, got my PhD in March of 2007. Awesome. Um, so what has your path been since Vanderbilt? Um, once I um, completed my PhD, I did a brief postdoc with uh, Simon Hayward, also here at, at Vanderbilt, um, also in the prostate cancer group. <laughs> and um, after that, I got a job as a, um, uh, my position was scientific associate with Precept Medical Communications um, in New Jersey, and basically have been working um, as a medical writer since then. Okay. So what is your, your job, what do you do in your job? So um, my job, um, so while I was at Precept and now I've moved on to another company, um, Envision Communications, um, we create um, promotional medical education materials for, um, um, for doctors and nurses. They're branded materials that we worked with. Um, basically, we work with pharmaceutical companies to create materials that are fair and balanced and on label for um, whatever product um, I'm working on at the time. Um, so I create a lot of um, slide decks and um, even printed pieces, things like that. But the key is they're all focused on a specific drug, um, usually. Yeah, OK. Um, so tell me what your typical day looks like. So my, um, my current job, um, I work remotely. Um, my company is based in Atlanta, um, and I work. I, live in Jersey City, New Jersey, so I work out of my home office. Um, so my typical day is working um, from home. Um, so I get to literally work in my pajamas a lot of the time. <laughs> um, but I spend a lot of time, um, you know, obviously my company's in Atlanta, and I have clients um, that are also in New Jersey, but um, most of the stuff I do is either on the computer, you know, online, or um, on the phone. I have, you know, various, all my meetings are usually teleconferences, um, so I have, you know, spend a good bit of time talking to people on the phone and, and working that way. Um, and uh, I do, uh, I do travel um, usually a couple times a month, um, and the locations vary. Um, the accounts I work on right now are, um, it's all U.S. based, so most of the travel is, um, you know, within the U.S., and it's usually a, a night or maybe two, mm -hmm. um, and then I'm back home. Great. Is postdoctoral training required for a career um, in medical communications? Um, the short answer is no. Um, Nowhere that you're applying for a job as a medical writer, or medical director, or any type of title like that, they're not going to be looking for necessarily postdoc training. Um, and I, I went directly into this from being a, I had done a short postdoc, but it was only about six months. So, um, and that wasn't really part of the, the consideration. One thing that might be important for somebody who's looking to move from academia into medical writing, um, if, um, if you're not a citizen or don't have a green card, you might want to consider, you know, get, doing a postdoc to kind of finish immigrating, um, because sometimes I think it can be harder to find a job if you, you know, haven't gotten a green card or depending on your visa status, that could be a challenge. Um, so, what skills from your postdoc training or even your PhD do you use in your current job? Um, I think there's a lot of skills from, you know, the people learn while they're in grad school and postdoc. Um, you have to work on a lot of different things all at once. Like I'm never just working on one project that I can kind of see from beginning to end. During one long-term project, I'm working on five or six short-term projects. And so the ability to multitask is really important. Um, and I think um, another one is time management. Um, you know, when you're working in the lab and doing experiments, you have to constantly budget your time and, you know, can I finish this experiment in the next three days or not? And what can I finish this afternoon before I have to go home? You know, so that constant time management um, skill is really important. Um, and I think also the ability to 
um, either work independently or as part of a larger group um, is something that's important too because I frequently have to um, you know, look something up and work on my own and sit and focus and write and think about something. But then I also have to be able to communicate really well with um, other people on my team that have different roles um, and then also with my clients and be able to explain to them how much time I need, be able to budget for um, you know, time on a project and, and stuff like that. So communication is key and then be able to work independently um, or in a team. Sure. Um, um, what other activities or courses or other engagements would you encourage current trainees to, to seek outside of the lab? Um, I think that um, just in trying to figure out what I wanted to do, I, uh, while I was still at Vanderbilt, I kind of sought out opportunities um, to explore opportunities in writing and editing. Um, I was part of the Vanderbilt Editors Club, which um, I was glad to see is still in existence. Um, so that was a good experience. I wasn't sure if I wanted to write or if I wanted to edit. And while I was here, it seemed that those two things kind of went hand in hand. But once you get out, it's like you're either really more of a writer or you're more of an editor. So you have to choose. Um, and so I did a little bit of writing on the side as a freelancer. Um, and I think if you can try to find some type of freelance writing or work with, um, say, another writer um, to just get a little bit of experience and understand what types of things and what the job is going to be like, um, that would be really, um, really valuable. Um, and there's, there's resources um, out there for people who are interested in doing that. Like, um, I know some people that went this route, they joined um, the American Medical Writers Association and they have a really good, um, I think, job posting site and you can ask questions, I think, once you're a member. I, I didn't do that, but I know other people have, have done that. And um, another great resource is the, the Hit List. Um, Emma Hit, um, she's great and my company actually still uses her job site and um, post there and stuff like that. So she's a great resource too. Um, okay, so let's talk about your job search. Um, what are the steps that you took to get your current job? I um, worked uh, with Kim a lot trying to figure out how to get out, how to get a writing job, because I really didn't know what to do, um, as I'm sure a lot of people don't. And um, through programs that the Brett office um, sponsored, um, I kind of, you know, learned about medical writing and I um, uh, came to a seminar that Emma Hitt did when I was here and that was a huge help. Um, I went to another seminar that another medical writer came in and just asked a lot of questions and figured out like how they went about it. And I, what ended up working for me is just applying to a lot of jobs um, through Monster and um, various job search sites like that. Um, once I kind of decided that writing was the, the focus that I wanted to um, wanted to have and um, so it, you know just apply until you find something. <laughs> um, let's see so what job search or career tips do you have for PhD students or postdocs interested in your field? Um, I would try to um, I would try to connect with people who are writers. Um, I know I, I periodically like through LinkedIn get um, requests from other people who are like looking to get out of grad school or looking to get out of their postdoc and you know how do you get started you know, things like that and I think a lot of people who especially have come from a uh, research background are going to be willing to help you know at least like give you some pointers I know there's some people that I've talked to on LinkedIn that I will probably never meet but I tried to to help them along the way and you know give them pointers so I think that's a good thing um, there are also a lot of recruiters um, who like recruiters, headhunters, like again, if you get on LinkedIn and start looking for jobs, there's a lot of people that are just job search talent and they are on, always on LinkedIn looking for, for good people. Um, so I think that that's a, a valuable resource too. So, so how do you network? Um, to be honest, a lot of the networking I do is just from people that I used to work with. Um, there's a lot of, um, especially like I live in, New Jersey, there's a lot of medical education agencies um, in that area. Um, and between New York and New Jersey, 
people don't seem to stay at one company very long. So people that I worked with just a few years ago have kind of scattered to the wind and they work now all over the place. Um, so just keeping in touch with them and LinkedIn and other sources like that. Um, so interviewing, do you have any positive or negative experiences you feel comfortable sharing, including advice about interviewing? Um, I guess some advice that I could give is when you go on, um, go on interviews or when you're even just preparing your resume, try to focus on what you've done as a student or as a postdoc um, and how that can be transferred to the job you're applying for, whether it's writing or somewhere else. Because um, what you don't want to do is come into an interview for a job in this kind of industry or any other industry and talk a lot about what types of experiments you did and um, you know really basic research. Um, they're not looking, like the people who are interviewing you aren't gonna understand and that's not what they're looking for. They're looking to see like, okay, do you have the like personality and communication skills and the ability to you know move into this position that they're looking to fill? Um, so I think that's yeah. important. <laughs> I've, I've talked to people who um, even after they've, worked um, as a medical writer, they'll interview for another position and they spend a lot of time talking about, you know, their research and what their thesis was on and stuff. And it's like, well, it's great and we all can talk about that. It's not really relevant to the position you're applying for. Um, so tell me a little about your work-life balance. Um, it varies. <laughs> uh, there are times when I work kind of a pretty typical nine to five day and while I'm really busy during that nine to five um, at five o'clock I can pretty much turn off and focus on family life I have a two and a half year old and you know he takes up a lot of my time but there are other times that I finish work and go pick him up from daycare and then continue to work after dinner um, so it, it varies um, and travel travel can be difficult um, and that'll vary a little bit depending on what job you have but um, it, that can be that can be a challenge, but um, I think overall it's pretty good um, because when I worked um, in a, a lab and my husband's a postdoc and he worked long hours too and there's lots of stuff that he has to go in on the weekends. I mean, I have to work some weekends, but so does he. So I think it all works out, but it's it's pretty good. good. What is one of your favorite memories from your time here at Vanderbilt? Um, I guess my favorite memory. There's so many. Um, because I met some great friends and I met my husband here. Um, we started, he was in the biological sciences program and I was in IGP. So there's a lot of great memories um, along that road. But um, I guess one of my favorite ones was um, toward the end of my um, PhD career, I uh, had gotten invited um, to do a, a oral presentation at um, the Society for Basic Urologic Research and um, won a travel award and everything and went and um, presented and it was so nice because it was a few months before my defense and um, I got to present kind of the whole story of my research up till then and it was just a great experience to explain the entire career at, you know my post or my uh, PhD career and um, that was that's something that I really enjoyed and I think that was one of the things that pushed me toward the medical communications mm -hmm. career anyway, because I liked explaining. I was one of those people that liked doing lab meeting. <laughs> <You know? Yeah. laughs> I liked to explain what I did, not necessarily do it five more times. Yeah. So um, that was a great experience. And then that same weekend, uh, my husband uh, proposed to me. So awesome. that was a really, yeah. really great, both professional and personal yeah. weekend. <laughs> Um, is there a particularly memorable experience, perhaps an embarrassing story or a humbling event that has really stayed with you? Um, when I was interviewing for my first job out of, um, out of grad school, um, so the, the position I ended up taking at Precept Medical, it, so it ended well. Um, my husband was interviewing in New York. Uh, we were staying in Manhattan because he was interviewing there. The company was in New Jersey, so I had to figure out how to get who I'd never been to Manhattan before. So I had to figure out how to get from Manhattan out to New Jersey and navigate the subway and the trains and all that stuff. Completely um, underestimated how long that would take and ended up missing my first interview. 
I got on a train and realized I was not going to get there in enough time. I had to call and tell them what had happened. And luckily, they were, you know, very understanding, and um, they were able to reschedule it for the next morning. And I made sure I had extra time and ended up getting that job. But at the time, I was a complete mess. <laughs> sure. um, okay, so finally, what words of wisdom do you have for current PhDs and postdocs as they enter their job search? I would just say, don't give up. I applied to a lot of jobs, and a lot of them I didn't hear anything back. And it can be very discouraging and um, you know frustrating at times, but just, just keep at it. And um, I would also say that if you're interested in going into medical writing, um, be willing to you know, look. Um, I don't know how many options are around Nashville. When I was here, there weren't a lot. But um, be willing, say, if you find a company in New York or in Atlanta or in California or whatever, be willing to uh, volunteer to fly yourself there to go to the interview. Because a lot of places, they'll see Oh, well, this person's in Tennessee, they're not going to come here to interview. Because I sat on um, interview panels where that was the opinion. Everybody had like, oh, well, this person's not going to come because they're in a different state. Let's hire somebody local. But if you, as you're applying, if you kind of volunteer that information to the recruiter or to whoever it is you um, are in contact with, you can maybe get that interview. Because that's, that's exactly what I did. My husband was applying in New York, and so I went with him and was going to try and interview while I was there and ended up getting a job that way. Okay, great. Thanks for coming, Erin. We're so glad to have you and thank you for all of your advice. We appreciate it. Thank you. This is fun. Yeah. <laughs>